Hello and welcome to this uh, next lecture on pattern recognition. Uh, we have been looking at for the last few classes on some basics of statistical learning theory. Essentially, we are asking uh, at a theoretical level uh, what kind of guarantees can we give on the generalization abilities of a learning algorithm. Okay. Specifically, we are co considering the question of uh, formally understanding the generalization abilities of a learning algorithm in a classification context. So, today will be the last class, we will wrap up uh, everything that we have done so far in terms of this dimension. So, let us uh, quickly recall what we have been doing. <coughs> Basically, we have uh, introduced the uh, risk minimization as the generic framework in which any method of learning from examples can be viewed uh, that allows us to take care of arbitrary distribution with respect to which examples come, different kinds of loss functions, all noise models and so on. So, risk minimization as we have seen is a very general model for uh, <coughs> uh, uh, learning from examples and we have uh, uh, defined where we know the feature, uh, feature space or what we call the input space x and the outcome space y. We choose a convenient family of classifiers h and uh, we define a loss function and risk is the expectation of loss and we are looking for the minimizer of risk. Uh, unfortunately, as we seen this cannot be minimized because to calculate risk we need the underlying probability distributions. Uh, so, we approximate the expectation that is in the risk by its uh, sample average that is how we got the empirical risk. So, what any learning algorithm can do is to minimize the empirical risk right all learning algorithms as we seen minimize the empirical risk with respect to some convenient uh, loss function ok, a 0 1 loss function or square error loss function or what have you. <coughs> but what we actually want is the minimizer of the risk, the two risk that is the expectation of loss. So, the question we are considering is when does minimizer of empirical risk be a good approximation to minimizer of true risk ok. Uh, <coughs> now, we minimize empirical risk over some family of classifiers h and what we seen is that if the VC dimension of this family of classifiers is finite uh, is infinite then the empirical risk minimization is not effective that is the minimizer of the empirical risk can have true risk that is vastly different from the global minimizer of the true risk. Okay. On the other hand if the VC dimension of, of the family of classifiers is finite then the finite VC dimension essentially implies that the convergence implied by law of large numbers that is the sample mean expectation uh, sample mean uh, approximation of expectation r hat and h converges to r h the two expectation of the risk uniformly over h. And this uniform convergence in turn guarantees that minimizer of empirical risk would also have low value of the true risk ok. So, essentially finally, the question <laughs> boils down to if you were uh, if the family of classifiers H or which you are minimizing empirical risk has finite VC dimension, then minimizing empirical risk is all right. In addition, we also saw that the true risk can be bounded above by empirical risk plus a complexity term uh, which goes to 0 as the ratio of the VC dimension of H by n. So, this also tells us that uh, how many examples we actually need before we can believe the empirical risk. So, if the empirical risk is sufficiently small, we can be confident that the true risk also be sufficiently small if the VC dimension of H divided by the number of examples is sufficiently small. So, higher the VC dimension, higher is the number of examples needed. So, in that sense, VC dimension not only tells us whether empirical uh, risk minimization is effective, but more importantly, it tells us the complexity of learning with a particular classifier H. So, for example, learning with uh, uh, linear classifiers, learning a best linear classifier might have less complexity than learning a polynomial classifier of degree up to p and um, uh, that happens because the VC dimension of one would be higher than the other ok. So, the VC dimension tells us the complexity of learning with a particular h and uh, correspondingly tells us uh, what is the number of examples we need before we can have confidence on empirical risk. In this sense, <coughs> um, while the bounds we got with uh, for this uh, generalization uh, error or the true risk of a classifier are rather loose, uh, it still gives us an idea of how many examples we need 
before we can be confident that low empirical risk would imply low true risk. Essentially, how many examples we need depends on VC dimension. As I said, as a thumb rule, we need at least 10 times the VC dimension as the number of examples. Okay. Uh, the we have uh, defined the VC dimension for the classifier case. That is when H is a family of binary value functions on X. So we are considering only two class classification problem, and we have seen that for this particular two class classification problem. Uh, we can define VC dimension in terms of the largest shattered subset. Of course, this the idea of VC dimension, the idea of bounding the true disk by empirical is for such a complex term uh, holds for all uh, kinds of families of functions. Though defining the corresponding VC dimension for other class of functions is more difficult. So, we have uh, restricted ourselves to only considering two class classifiers. Okay. So, let us recall this uh, definition of uh, VC dimension based on the shattered uh, subset <coughs> given any subset of our input space that is the feature space uh, let us say a is a subset of x it is said to be shattered by the family of classifiers h if for every subset b of a there is a h so give me any subset b of this of a, of a, of a subset a so give me any set of uh, points in the feature space a then for every subset b of a there is a particular h in my family of classifiers such that h takes 1 for all points in b and takes 0 on all points in a minus b. <laughs> if of course, the h that depend uh, h that exists will depend on the b that we chose, but for every subset b of a if I can find a h that realizes that classification by choosing a subset of b is effectively as if we are saying out of the set of points a I have now I want to label all points in b as 1 and all points not in b as 0. Right, that is what and then there is a particular classifier in H that can achieve the classification. If this can be done for every subset of A, then we say A is shattered. So, if an M point set is shattered, so if A has M points, then there are 2 power M different <coughs> uh, subsets that is 2 power M different ways of labeling each point in A with either 0 or 1. And if A is shattered, that means for each one of the 2 power m possible labelings, there is a function in H, there is a classifier in H which will realize that labeling or which will uh, which will classify the uh, points as labeled. So, shattering of a set A simply means you you do an arbitrary labeling of the points of A with zeros and ones, then there must be a classifier in my family of classifiers that would achieve that classification. So, when an M point set is shattered, each of the 2 power m possible labelings of points in A are realizable with functions in H, which in turn means what we call m h m the maximum number of distinguishable functions in H based on all possible m tuples of examples is 2 power m. Right? That is the reason why the V C dimension can now be defined as the cardinality of the largest shattered subset. <coughs> so, we do we, as we see in last class. V C dimension of H is the cardinality of the largest shattered subset of X. Uh, I will emphasize once again shattering is the property of a subset of X and a family of classifiers. A subset of X is shattered by a family of classifiers. So, whenever we say shattered because the H is already understood. So, V C dimension is the cardinality of the largest shattered subset of X. <laughs> so, on the other uh, when we say largest we are assuming there exists a largest. For example, for every integer m, there is an m point subset of x that is shattered, that means there is no larger subset, and hence V C dimension of h is infinity. Okay. <coughs> uh, as I mentioned last class, if an m point set uh, is shattered by h, then uh, for any m prime, m prime less than m, there is also an m prime point sub, uh, set of x that is shattered, namely an m prime point subset of the same set. So, if a set A with m points is shattered, that means all possible labelings of those m points are realizable by the classifiers in H. You take any subset of that A, then all possible labelings of that subset are also realizable by classifiers in H. Thus, whenever there is a m point subset that is shattered, for every m prime less than m, there will also be an m prime point subset that is shattered. So, this is same as saying that the number of maximum number of distinguishable functions grows as 2 power m only till m reaches V c dimension of h and hence defining V c dimension by the large cardinality of the larger shadow subset is correct. Okay. 
Once again, let us understand what shattering means. If we find one m point subset of x that is shattered, then we can conclude that the VC dimension is at least m because there is at least one m point subset that is shattered. Because this does not mean that all m point subsets are shattered. There may be other m point subsets that are not shattered, right? But if there is at least one m point subset that is shattered, then we can conclude that VC dimension is at least m. On the other hand, to show that VC dimension is strictly less than m, we have to show that no m point set is shattered, right? To show that it is at least m, all we need to do is exhibit one example. Whereas to show that it is less than m, we have to show that no possible m point subset is shattered by h. Okay. <laughs> we consider some examples last class. Um, for example, we showed that the VC dimension of axis parallel rectangles is 4, and as I mentioned, it is also interesting to know that uh, the family of axis parallel rectangles can be represented by 4 parameters because each axis parallel rectangle is completely determined by the coordinates of its uh, bottom left and top right corners which need 4 numbers. Right. <coughs> we also seen that if you take h to be all possible 2 class classifiers h is equal to 2 power x the power set of x then we see dimension is infinite. Right. Essentially if the family of classifiers or which your minimizing risk is too flexible then we see dimension becomes infinite. Okay. <coughs> we seen both these examples last class. Um, Uh, the the infinite VC dimension example that we considered of course looks too drastic. We are saying if we take all possible two class classifiers, then VC dimension is finite. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, very obvious because uh, you can't learn if uh, you know we don't restrict our set of classifiers at all. But that's not how VC dimension becomes infinite. It's essentially this uh, this fuzzy phrase too flexible. We can we can think of many other families of classifiers for which VC dimension will be infinite because all those other families of classifiers are essentially too flexible in the sense. For example, it is very difficult to uh, parameterize them with finite parameters. Okay, so we'll we'll look at one more example. Right? Let's say H is the family of all convex polygons or odd two. For example, axis parallel rectangle is a specific convex polygon which contains only four sides. <laughs> Even among four side convex polygons is a very specific thing because it has to be an axis parallel and rectangle. But instead of that, suppose you take all convex polygons, of course, this is much much smaller than <coughs> small in the sense there are many two class classifiers which cannot be expressed as convex polygons because uh, convex polygons means one class is a convex set, <coughs> right? The region of one class is always a convex set. So, that looks like fairly restricted, but still because you allow all convex polygons of any number of sides, once again it is too flexible, it is like uh, fitting polynomials of any degree to points. <coughs> so, if we take H to be the family of all convex polygons over R2, once again the VC dimension will be infinite, right. Why? Because the family is too flexible, because I am allowing convex polygons of any number of sides. So, let us show this, <coughs> so that we understand uh, where the infinite VC dimension comes from. What do you have to show that uh, VC dimension is infinite? We have to show that you give me any integer m, any any positive integer m, then I can find an m point subset in R2 that is shattered by H. Mind you, we do not have to be able to show that every m point set is shattered. All I have to show is for every m, there is at least one m point subset that is shattered. So, I have to just choose one particular or I have to exhibit one particular m point set for every m that is shattered. <laughs> Here is how I can do it. You give me any m, I take all the m points on a circle. Circle put anywhere in R2, its uh, circle and radius does not matter, uh, its uh, center and radius does not matter, except that all the points have to be on a circle. So, I will take an m point subset or m point set uh, such that all m points are on a circle. Now, we are going to show that this is shattered by uh, the family of all convex polygons. <coughs> what do you have to show that? Now, given any labeling of these m points, so you arbitrarily label these m points 1 or 0, then given any one labeling like that, we have to show that there is a convex polygon such so that the points labeled 0 are outside the convex polygon 
and points labeled 1 are inside or on the polygon as we have been doing all along. Uh, we, we are taking our, uh, uh, our functions to be such that whenever we take uh, like axis parallel rectangles on, on the polygon also as class 1. So, uh, it is an arbitrary thing, but let us take like that. So, we have to show that given any m and, uh, and I take all the m points in a circle. Now, you can put any labeling of this point for 1 and 0. Now, I have to show you a convex polygon so that all points labeled 0 are outside the outside of it and points labeled 1 are inside or on the polygon. Okay. So, I will construct this as, <coughs> as follows. So, I have taken all the m points on a circle. Now, you take any arbitrary labeling of these points. Then what do I do? I have to draw a convex polygon for it. I will draw it as follows. I start with any point labeled 1 as one, one vertex of the polygon. Then join that point to the next point in the set that is labeled 1. Right? I will start with a 1 point, then skip over all the zeros, so to say. So, I will find where is the next point labeled 1 and join this one, uh, this point labeled 1 to the next point labeled 1. What is the next point in R2? Well, all the points are in a circle. So, I can take the next point to be at the next one in the clockwise direction. <coughs> so, I keep going like this till I reach the starting point. What I have is a convex polygon because I just join points on a circle and it is easy to see that uh, uh, we have a convex polygon whose vertices are all points labeled 1 and all the points labeled 0 are outside it because uh, uh, I am drawing a card in, in the circle which is inside the circle between two successively uh, two points that are successive labeled ones. All the points in between are on the arc those are the labeled ones. So, they will be outside the circle. So, here is a example. <coughs> so, I have taken 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 points on a circle. Arbitrarily label them this is 0, this is <coughs> I, uh, to, lab, to show the labelings I have put the points as uh, a circle or a cross. So, uh, all of them are on a circle even though the, the labeling sometimes comes on it and sometimes a little bit because of my poor drawing. Uh, so, this is label 0, this is label 1, this is label 0, this is label 1, these two are label 0, these two are label 1. So, I start from this point let us say and then join it to the next point label 1, join it to the next point label 1, join it to the next point label 1 and join it to the next point label 1. Right. Obviously, this is a chord and all the points label 0 are in the arc of that chord. So, all of them are outside the convex polygon. So, this way all points labeled 0 will always be outside the convex polygon and all points labeled <coughs> 1 will be on the convex polygon, they will be the vertices of the polygon. Okay. So, this shows that any set of m points can be shattered and hence the family of all possible convex polygons also has V c dimension infinite. Okay. <coughs> now, let us move from these examples to one class of functions which are very important to us. We, we mentioned last class that linear classifiers is an important special case actually we spent a lot of time before we coming to uh, before we came to the uh, series of lectures on statistical learning theory on learning linear classifiers, right? linear classifiers and linear regression functions minimizing empirical risk under square loss function. Uh, we have considered a lot of al algorithms and seen very many important properties of it as will become evident later on in the course linear classifiers are important special case of classifiers. So, let us ask what is the V c dimension of linear classifiers. <coughs> right. So, in R d some d dimensional space we want to know what is the V c dimension of hyperplane classifiers. We are considering only two class classifiers any two class linear classifier is represented by hyperplane right you uh, there is a hyperplane in R d and one side is one class other side is other class. So, the set of all hyperplane classifiers is same as set of hyperplane functions uh, set of all linear classifiers is same as set of hyperplane functions. As it turns out the V c dimension of this class is d plus 1. If you are considering feature space of dimension d then V c dimension of linear classifiers is d plus 1. So, we are now going to prove this. Okay. This, this is going to be the main result of this class. <coughs> so, before uh, we prove this in general d dimensions let us first consider the case of hyperplanes in R 2. Right. So, in R 2 I have to show that um, that um, the the V c dimension is 3 right? because uh, d is 2 d plus 1 is 3. 
So, what do I have to show? I have to show that V c dimension of hyperplanes in R 2 is 3. As we have seen to show that V c dimension of something is m, what do I have to show? I have to exhibit at least one m point subset that is shattered and show that no m plus 1 point set is shattered. So, to show that V c dimension of hyperplanes in R 2 is 3, I have to show that there is at least one 3 point set that is shattered and no set of 4 or more points or say no set of 4 points is shattered. <laughs> that is what you have to do. We have to first show that there is at least one three point set that is shattered and then we have to also show that no four point set is shattered. Okay. <coughs> so, here is three point set as a matter of fact you take any three point that form a triangle then you can shatter it as a matter of fact I show only see what do you have to show for shattering that I can draw a hyperplane keeping all three points on one side I have not shown that. So, that will be that hyperplane. So, that all 3 labeled as 1 or all 3 labeled as 0 is gone. Then the remaining labeling is <coughs> one of them 1 or the other 2 as 0. So, I should be able to separate any 1 from the other 2. So, there are 3 such cases. So, here are the 3 hyperplanes that separate any 1 from the other 2. Right? <coughs> so, for example, these are the 3 hyperplanes that show you that the 3 points are shattered. Right? Very simple. As you already seen that one three point set is shattered does not mean that all three point sets are shattered right. <coughs> Here is a simple example of a three point set that is not shattered. So, if you give me three points in a line right, label the middle one as 0 the other two as 1s then I cannot draw any hyperplane that puts the middle point on one side and the other two points on the other side of the hyperplane. So, if the 3 points are collinear then the set is not shattered ok <coughs> that is also valid. Yeah, there is just one other thing I would like you to pay attention to while I drew the coordinate axis here the coordinate axis is really useless right. Shattering is essentially a geometric property right given these 3 points I am telling you I can separate them uh, with hyperplanes whether my coordinate origin is here or here or here or here if I move this coordinate origin anywhere it makes no difference to whether or not a given set of points is shattered. <coughs> right? So, shattering is essentially a property of how the points are organized in space rather than what their actual algebraic coordinates are. So, the, the coordinate origin for example makes no difference to shattering right? the same is true of this. Right? <coughs> all I want is the 3 points in a line. Right? It really does not matter uh, with respect to the origin where they are. So, I can move the origin anywhere, but these 3 points will not be shattered. Okay? This is also important towards lateron. All right. Now, to complete the proof I have to show that <coughs> no 4 points that is shattered. We already know something a 3 point set is not shattered if the 3 points are collinear, which means give me any 4 point set if 3 of the 4 points are collinear then the set is not shattered. So, all possible 4 point sets in which 3 of the 4 points are collinear is anyway not shattered that is over that is shown. Now, what is left? I have to show for 4 point sets where no 3 are collinear. In R 2 if you give me 4 points such that no 3 are collinear then the 4 points form a quadrilateral. Right. That is the definition of a quadrilateral. Given any 4 points in R2, if uh, no 3 of them are in a line, then the 4 points will form a quadrilateral. Right. <coughs> because they form a quadrilateral, if I label one pair of opposite vertices by 1 and the other pair of opposite vertices by 0, then no hyperplane can realize this particular labeling. Right. <coughs> um, I hope that is clear. Uh, this is uh, ok let me show the so here is such a generic set give me 4 points as the no 3 are collinear then the 4 points form a quadrilateral for a quadrilateral there is always I can say which are the opposite pairs of vertices right so this is one opposite pair of vertices through which <coughs> uh, one diagonal will be and this is the other pair of opposite vertices so if I label these two by one class say one and these two by other class say 0 
<coughs> there does not exist a linear classifier. As a matter of fact, if you remember when we did perceptron, we showed one of the simple problem that perceptron cannot solve with the XOR problem, right. This is like the XOR problem. As I said, coordinate origin makes no sense, no difference. So, I can think of let us say this is 0 and this is 1. So, uh, essentially these points can correspond to 0, 1 and 1, 0 and these points can correspond to 0, 0 and 1, 1. So, 0, 0 and 1, 1 has to give me one output and 0, 1 and 1, 0 has to give me another output. So, this is a typical exclusive or gate kind of problem that cannot be solved by a linear classifier <coughs> because there does not exist a line to separate this pair of points with this pair of points. Right? So, this is this is going to be our running example to show <coughs> that uh, you know there are simple problems that can be that cannot be solved by uh, linear classifiers. Anyway, in this particular uh, exercise, this shows us that no four points that is shattered because of the four points if any three are collinear then anyway it cannot be shattered. If no three are collinear then the four points have to form a quadrilateral and if they form a quadrilateral they cannot be shattered because if I label one pair of vertices by one and the other pair of vertices by zero then no linear classifier can realize this classification. So, this shows that <coughs> uh, there is a three point set that is shattered no four point set is shattered and hence which the dimension of hyperplanes is uh, hyperplanes in R2 is 3. Okay. <coughs> so, now let us consider hyperplanes in Rd. What do you have to show? We have to show that the VC dimension of hyperplanes in Rd is d plus 1. Once again, what does this mean? I have to show that there is at least one set of d plus 1 points that is shattered and no set of d plus 2 or more points can be shattered. Right? I have to exhibit one set of d plus 1 points that can be shattered and no set of d plus 2 or more points can be shattered. Right? This is what we are going to prove now. Okay. A bit of maths, a lot of equations. So, let us go slowly. Um, to show that a set of m points is shattered by a family of hyperplanes, what does that mean? A set is shattered if every possible labeling of these points by 1 and 0, for every possible labeling of these points by 1 and 0, there is a classifier in my back that realizes that classification, which is same as saying the following. See, my classifiers are all uh, linear classifiers. So, a given labeling, if is realized by my classifiers, that means the, the points labeled 0 are linearly separable from the points labeled 1. Right? If I have a set of points, some of them are labeled 0 and some of them are labeled 1 and there is a linear classifier that can realize this classification. That means, the set of points labeled 0 are linearly separable from the set of points labeled 1, which is same as saying given any m point set, if I divide that set into two sets, one containing m 1 points, other containing m minus m 1 is equal to m 2 points, right. I, I <coughs> partition that set into two sets, one containing m 1 points, other containing some m 2 points, m minus m 1 points. We need to show that these two sets of points are linearly separable. So, sh to show that an m point set is shattered by a family of hyperplanes, what you have to show is for every possible division of this set into two subsets, the resulting two subsets are linearly separable. This is what you have to show. So, to show this, we have to first understand the geometry of linear separability. How can we say whether two given sets of points are linearly separable or not? So, to understand this geometry in a way that uh, we need, um, here is a, an important concept that we need. We need the concept of what is called a convex hull. I do not know how many people, <coughs> how many of you know what a convex hull is. Uh, let us define the convex hull. I am assuming that all you people know uh, what is a convex combination and what is a convex set. I will anyway, I'll, I'll briefly tell it when I am defining a convex hull. Uh, given a set S yes, contain, containing the points x1 to xm, these are all points in Rd. The convex hull of S is defined to be a set of all x so that x can be written as summation i is equal to 1 to m alpha x i where x i are these x 1 to x m right i is equal to 1 to m alpha x i where the scale alpha i are scalars and the scalars alpha i are such they are all non zero and they sum to 1. <coughs> so, given any set of vectors x 1 to x m and set of scalars alpha 1 to alpha m 
where the scalar satisfy alpha a greater than or equal to 0 and summation alpha is equal to 1, that this vector summation alpha x i, I mean vector or scalar <coughs> uh, summation alpha x i i is equal to 1 to m is called a convex combination of these points. Given points x 1 to x m summation i is equal to 1 to m alpha x i is called a convex combination of x 1 to x m if the scalar alpha is satisfy these two conditions. <coughs> So, a convex hull is nothing but a set of a set that of points that can be written as a convex combination of points of S. So, given a set S of some finite points, then the convex hull of S is a set of all points that can be written as a convex combination of points. S. Suppose there are only two points, the convex combination uh, in R2 or in even in RD is the line segment that joins these two points, right, because of <coughs> this condition. For example, if a three points in R2 uh, which form a triangle, then the convex hull is the triangular disc formed by uh, joining those uh, three making a triangle uh, as uh, 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 with, with those three points as vertices, then all points which are on or inside the triangle become the convex hull of those three points. <coughs> uh, a little later, I will show you some simple geometric example. Uh, let us say uh, I am given two sets of points in R D, S 1 consisting of x 1 to x m, S 2 consisting of y 1 to y m. Then a very useful result for us uh, is that these sets of points S 1 and S 2 are linearly separable if and only if convex hull of S 1 and convex hull of S 2 do not intersect. That is the see convex hull of S 1 is some set of points in R D which is obtained as convex combinations of points from S 1. Similarly, convex hull of S2 is uh, that subset of RD which is obtained as convex combination of points in S2. So, the set of points S1 and S2 are linearly separable if and only if the convex hulls of these two sets of points do not intersect. <coughs> so, two sets of points in RD are linearly separable if and only if their convex hulls do not intersect. It is not very difficult to show <coughs> by using some well known property of convex sets. Uh, so, let us show this. Um, given any two disjoint convex sets in R D, see every convex set uh, the, the, the property of convexity, see uh, what is a convex set? A convex set uh, is a set where if you take any two points and find convex combination of those two points, all convex combinations of those two points are inside the set. Right, that is how a convex set is defined. The convex set is a, set <coughs> is a subset of R D such that if I take any two points in that set and find the convex combinations, find the convex combination is just drawing a line joining those two points. All convex combinations are in that line segment on that line segment. So, if I take any two points in the set and join a line or join them by line, then all points in that line are inside the set such a set is a convex set. The convex hull because it is made of convex combinations of points in S will be a convex set. <laughs> Given any two disjoint convex set in R D, there always exists a hyperplane such that the two convex sets are either side of the hyperplane. This is because any given convex set can be supported by a hyperplane. Supported means there exists a hyperplane which just touches the convex set and all points of the convex set are <coughs> on one side of the hyperplane, meaning there will be a hyperplane such that the normal to the hyperplane will always make an acute angle with every point on the convex set. <coughs> that is the reason given two disjoint convex sets in R D, there will always exist a hyperplane such that the two convex sets are on either side of the hyperplane. So, given this, if convex hull of S 1 and convex hull of S 2 do not intersect, that means convex hull of S 1 and convex hull of S 2 are two disjoint convex sets. Then there will be a hyperplane such that convex hull of S 1 is on one side of the hyperplane, convex hull of S 2 is on the other side of the hyperplane and the way the convex hulls are made, S is the subset of convex hull of S for <coughs> any set because it is a trivial convex combination, 1 alpha is 1 and all others are 0 uh, because S is a subset of convex hull of uh, S. If convex hull of S 1 and convex hull of S 2 can be linearly uh, separable, then S 1 and S 2 are also linearly separable. So, this shows that if 
the convex hulls do not intersect, then S1 S2 are linearly separable. Now, we will show the other way if S1 S2 are linearly separable, then the convex hulls do not intersect. <laughs> so, let us assume that S1 S2 are linearly separable. What does linear separability mean? Recall from our <coughs> lectures and at the time of where we discussed perceptron, we define linear separability. Linear separability means there is exists a hyperplane such that all points of S1 are one side of the hyperplane, all points of S2 are in the other side of the hyperplane. <coughs> so, the hyperplane is in Rd is determined by W on B, W is a uh, d dimensional vector and B is a scalar. So, if S1 and S2 are linearly separable, then there exists W on B. <coughs> So, the W transpose xi plus b is greater than 0 for all xi in S1 and W transpose yi plus b is less than 0 for all y in S2. <laughs> now, this is what we are given because we are given that S1 S2 are linearly separable. Now, let x is equal to summation alpha i xi be any point in the convex hull of S1. Then, suppose we take W transpose x plus b. Now, x is this. So, this will be alpha i W transpose xi plus b which I can write as summation over x i belong to S 1 because this this summation is over x i belong to S 1. Summation over x i belong to S 1 alpha i into w transpose x i plus b. Why can I write this? Because if I take the second term that is b summation alpha i will be equal to b because summation alpha is equal to 1. Right. So, I can put b inside the summation by multiplying alpha i with w transpose x i plus b. Now, for every x i in S 1, W transpose x i plus b is greater than 0 and we know alpha i's are positive. So, the summation over x i in S 1 alpha i times W transpose x i plus b will also be positive. Right. So, what it means is whatever may be the W and b that separate S 1 and S 2 are such that W transpose x plus b will also be positive for every x in the convex hull of S 1 not just x in S 1, but for every x in the convex hull of S 1 by exactly identical argument, we can show that W transpose y plus b is less than 0 for every y in convex hull of S 2, which means there are some W on b so that for all points on the convex hull of S 1 uh, in the convex hull of S 1 W transpose x plus b is greater than 0 and for all points on the convex hull of S 2 W transpose x y plus b is strictly less than 0, which means convex hull of S 1 and convex hull of S 2 cannot intersect. Okay. This shows that the two convex cells do not intersect and when the convex cells do not intersect, we, should, we completed the proof. So, what we have shown? If the convex cells do not intersect, then S1 and S2 are separa linearly separable. If S1 and S2 are linearly separable, then convex cells do not intersect. Thus, we shown that two sets of points in RD are linearly separable if and only if their convex cells do not uh, are, are linearly separable right? or, or convex cells do not intersect. <coughs> so, here is the example take this set of points and this set of points they are linearly separable because I can draw a line. <coughs> what will the convex hull of these points and to make all con convex combinations. So, as I said essentially the convex hull will be that right. I join the, all the, the outer lying points <coughs> uh, with the lines to make a convex polygon. So, all points on and inside the polygon are the convex cells. So, for those for this set of points and for this set of points those are the convex cells and the set of points are linearly separable if and only if the convex cells are linearly separable right. Because the convex cell because the convex cell is such that you know it does not go beyond the extreme point so to say in the set and hence if the two sets are linearly separable right the convex cells will also be linearly separable. This is what we just know um, algebraically shown. <coughs> okay. So, now let us go back to using this to show that V C dimension of hyperplanes in R D is D plus 1. Before that we will prove one theorem. Given m points in R D, take any one of them as origin, then the set of m points is shattered if and only if the remaining m minus 1 points, remaining meaning the points other than the origin are linearly independent. So, showing if you give me m minus 1 points on the origin in R d that makes m points. The set of m points is shattered if and only if the non-zero m minus 1 points are linearly independent. So, to show this because if and only if to show this I have to show that linearly independent implies shattering 
shattering implies linearly independent. So, for the first part let us show that linearly independence implies shattering. So, we are given points a set of points 0 and m minus 1 points let us call them x 1 x 2 x m minus 1 be the set. This is going to be the set for throughout this proof. So, let us remember this is the set here 0 is the origin or the 0 vector in R d. Okay. We are given that the m minus 1 points are linearly independent we are showing that given linearly independent implies shattering. Right. So, we are given that the m minus 1 point linearly independent which means for any scalars gamma i summation gamma i x i is equal to 0 only if all gamma is a 0 right? unless all gamma is a 0 I cannot have summation gamma x is equal to 0 for any scalars gamma i that is what they are linearly independent means. Okay? So, this is what we are given how to show they are shattered. So, to show shattered so let us assume they are not shattered they are not shattered that means there is a way of dividing them into two sets s1 and s2 such that they are, uh, they are not linearly separable right they are not shattered means the set can be divided into s1 and s2 such that s1 and s2 are not linearly separable which means convex cell of s1 intersection convex cell of s2 is not equal to 5 because we have seen not linearly separable is same as the convex cells intersecting which means there is a point which is in the intersection of convex cell of s1 and convex cell of s2 any point in convex cell of s1 can be represented as summation alpha i x i x i belong to s1 any point in convex cell of s2 can be represented as summation beta i y i y i in s2 note that s1 and s2 are disjoint sets so the x i's here will be all different from the y i's here because the convex cells intersect there is at least one set of alpha and beta i such that summation alpha x i for x i in s 1 is equal to summation beta i y i for y i in s 2 where of course, alpha, alpha and beta sum to 1 and they are positive. So, if I bring it the on this side right uh, call for all x i in s 1 call gamma is equal to alpha i for all x i in s 2 I call gamma is equal to minus beta i then this is what I have. So, out of the m minus 1 points some will be in s 1 some will be in s 2 if I bring it this side I am considering all points uh, <coughs> all the m minus 1 points in s. So, essentially what I have is that there exists scalar gamma i that i is equal to 1 to m minus 1 gamma x is equal to 0, but this is not allowed because I am given that the uh, points are uh, uh, positive and not all gamma i can be 0 because gamma i are obtained from this alpha i beta i right and alpha i and beta I have to sum to 1. So, not all of them can be 0. So, if the set is not shattered then there must exist scalars gamma i satisfying this which is not possible because x i s are linearly independent which means <coughs> linearly independent means shattering. Okay. So, we completed the proof that uh, if the remaining m minus 1 points are linearly independent then the set is not shattered but then the set is shattered. Okay. So, the second part we have to show that shattered implies linearly independent we have shown that if you give me 0 x 1 x m minus 1 if x 1 to x m minus 1 are linearly independent then the set is shattered. Now, we are showing that if the set is shattered then x 1 to x m minus 1 are linearly independent. So, a implies b is same as not b implies not a that is called the contra positive form. So, we will show this in the contra positive form namely not linearly independent implies not shattered. The not linearly independent means now this time there are scalars alpha i. So, that summation alpha x i is equal to 0 not all, all alpha i are 0, but summation alpha x i is 0 this is just a linear combination mind you this is not a convex combination because we are only given that they are not linearly independent. So, there exists a linear combination of x i that, that is 0. So, for example, some of the alpha is may be positive some of them may be negative the alpha is do, do not have to sum to 1 it just shows all that not linearly independent means is that there is one linear combination of x i that will uh, <coughs> that will sum to 0. Okay. We are given that there exists alpha i such that i is equal to 1 to m minus 1 alpha x i is equal to 0. So, in a linear combination let us remember that the scalars can take any positive or negative values firstly they can be positive or negative and there is no restriction such as they have to sum to 1 or anything. So, we will consider two separate cases <coughs> in the first case where alpha i are the same sign that is the simplest case and that will also give us some idea of the proof for the general case and then we consider the general case where they can be both positive as well as negative alpha i. Okay. So, let us suppose alpha i this all alpha i the same sign 
we have we have been given the alpha is are that this linear combination is 0. So, if all of them are the same sign either all of them are positive or all of them are negative. If all of them are negative I can multiply by minus 1 and the equation still holds. So, if all alpha are of the same sign then what I am given is that summation i is equal to 1 to m, m minus 1 modulus of alpha i into x i is equal to 0. Right, uh, we are considering only real scalars that is why this is the absolute value. <laughs> Now, if we take gamma i to be absolute value of alpha i by summation uh, absolute value of alpha j, then gamma i is greater than or equal to 0, summation i is equal to m minus 1 gamma i is equal to 1, right? that is easy to see. I just, just normalize this by dividing it by some uh, modulus uh, absolute value of alpha j. So, this gamma is now or greater than or equal to 0 and summation i is equal to 1 to m minus 1 gamma i is equal to 1. So, what do I have now? If I divide this equation, by summation over j um, absolute value of alpha j right, there is some constant. So, I can divide this that then the then the factor becomes gamma i. So, what I have is i equal to 1 to m minus 1 gamma i x i equal to 0 where gamma i is are such that gamma i is greater than equal to 0 and summation gamma i is equal to 1 which means what I have on the left side is a convex combination of points in x i that is I have a convex combination of x1, x2, x m minus 1, which gives me the 0 vector. What does that mean? The 0 vector is in the convex hull of the rest of the m minus 1 points, right? <coughs> because a convex hull of the rest of the m minus 1 points contains all convex combinations of xi, and there is one convex combination of xi that equals 0, which means the 0 vector is inside the convex hull of the rest of the points, which in turn means. Suppose, I am my set S is 0 x 1 x 2 x m minus 1. So, if I divide into two subsets s 1 and s 2, where s 1 contains x 1 x 2 x m minus 1 and s 2 contains 0, then the convex hull of s 1 and s 2 intersect. Right. There is a point in s 2 namely 0 of course, that is the only point in s 2 which is inside the convex hull of s 1. So, because convex hulls of s 1 and s 2 intersect, s 1 and s 2 cannot be linearly separated. Right which means <laughs> the original set S cannot be shattered. Right? That means, not linearly independent implies not shattered. So, what have we shown? If you give me <coughs> m points in R, uh, R d, then if I take one of them as origin and if the rest of the m minus 1 points are linearly independent, then the set is shattered. They are not linearly independent, they are not shattered. Of course, for the not linearly independent they are not shattered, we have done it only for the simple case right. We have been considering so far the case where all alpha are of the same sign. So, to consider the more general case, but the more general case is the same thing see because all of them are same sign I have this. Once I have this I could normalize to make it a convex combination. Once I make a convex combination I can show convex cells intersect. The same thing will follow for the more general case. So, we consider the general case of course, I could have only considered this because this includes a special case some of them are positive some of them are negative, but anyway let us say now <coughs> they are both positive and negative alpha is. So, let us say the set i i i 1 consists of all indices i such that the corresponding alpha is are positive and i 2 contains those which are negative. Um, uh, mind you these alpha is or those scalars which are in the linear combination of x i's that goes to 0 because x i's are given to be not linearly independent there is one alpha x i equal to 0. With respect to those alpha i's I am defining the sets i 1 and i 2 <coughs> so that i 1 consists of all indices where alpha i's are positive i 2 consists of all indices that where alpha i's are negative. Now, I know that over all points i summation alpha i x i is equal to 0. Now, let us say we define a beta i is equal to alpha i for all i in i 1 a gamma i is equal to minus alpha i for all in i 2. Now, I have summation alpha i x i is equal to 0, the i in i 1 those are positive terms, i in i 2 those are all negative terms. So, I can take all the negative terms on the other side, if I take negative terms on the other side the coefficients become gamma i right? and the positive terms the coefficient become beta i. So, <coughs> so, what I have now because I am given summation alpha i x i is equal to 0 summation alpha x equal to 0 is same as 
summation over i in that i 1 beta x i is summation over j in set i 2 gamma j x j. Essentially from the equation summation alpha x i equal to 0 I have taken all the negative terms on the other side. So, I get this equation. So, now the equation is nice because all the scalars are positive now right for in i 1 alpha is positive. So, beta is positive in i 2 alpha is negative. So, gamma is positive. <coughs> Now, this almost looks like if I take x i in i 1 x i so that i is in i 1 and <coughs> as one set and x j j in i 2 as another set then a linear combination of the points of first set is equal to the linear combination of the points of the second set where the linear combination contains all uh, positive coefficients. <coughs> so, I have to not turn it into a convex combination, but I can't simply normalize because the summation beta is may be different from summation gamma is right. I have to somehow just <coughs> uh, make sure that that does not pose a problem. So, that is what we are going to do next ok. So, given this <coughs> what we are doing now is let us say summation of beta is i, I belong to i 1 is z and summation of gamma j is z prime. If z is equal to z prime we are done because it simply says that uh, if I divide by uh, the corresponding co common uh, uh, normalizing factor then this becomes a convex combination of some of the x i this becomes convex combination of the remaining x i. So, the two convex cells intersect and hence this set and that set cannot be separated, <coughs> but in general z and z prime do not have to be equal one of them has to be greater than the other. So, without loss of generality let us assume z is greater than equal to z prime. <coughs> now, I can write the earlier equation this is my equation uh, beta x i is equal to gamma j x j i in i 1 j in i 2. That equation now I will write as <coughs> uh, I, I, I divided by z first. So, I get beta i by z into x i is equal to gamma j by z into x j to that now I add a 0 right. This is some scalar z minus z prime by z multiplied by 0 the 0 vector. So, this gives me anyway 0. So, it is still true right. I earlier have beta x i is equal to gamma j x j I divided both sides by z. So, beta i by z into x i is equal to gamma j by z into x j <coughs> this summation i i 1 this summation j i 2. Now, I can always add a 0. So, I add a 0 with the coefficients z minus z prime by z. <coughs> what is the purpose of this? The purpose is now this is a convex combination of <coughs> x i with i and i 1 because summation beta i by z summed over i is 1 they are anyway positive and they sum to 1. Now, this entire thing on the right hand side is a convex combination of x j so that j in i 2 plus the 0 vector <coughs> because if I sum all the coefficient for x j j in i 2 the coefficient is gamma j by z and for the 0 vector the coefficient is z minus z prime by z. If I sum all of them summation over j gamma j by z plus z minus z prime by z summation gamma j is z prime. So, this becomes z prime by z I add both of them I will get 1. <coughs> So, what is there on the right hand side now is the convex combination of all the x x j s such that j in i 2 plus the 0 vector ok. So, we take s 1 to be x i such that i in i 1 s 2 to be x i such that i in i 2 union the 0 vector. So, s 2 is all x i i in i 2 and the 0 vector s 1 is x i such that i in i 1 then this is a convex combination of points in S 1 this is a convex combination of points in S 2 because the convex combination of x j such that j in i 2 plus the 0 vector right. So, this is a convex combination of points in S 2 right. So, if I take S 1 to be this and S 2 to be this <coughs> what we have shown is that the convex cells of S 1 and S 2 intersect right? because the convex cells of S 1 and S 2 intersect s 1 and s 2 are not linearly separable right. This shows s is not shattered. So, what have we shown now with this completes the proof of the theorem and what does the theorem say? If you give me n points m points in R d take one of them origin if the remaining m minus 1 points are linearly independent then the set is shattered if they are not linearly independent the set is not shattered ok. That is what we have shown this completes the proof of the theorem that we listed. Now, we have to see how this theorem tells me that uh, V c dimension of hyperplanes is d plus 1. 
Okay. First, as I mentioned already, shattering of set of points by hyperplanes does not depend on coordinate origin. So, I can always take one of the points as origin by shift of origin. So, in our D, we can have D linearly independent points. Right? So, D linearly independent points along with origin will give me D plus 1 points of the kind I want. Right? I can take D plus 1 points, origin plus any other D linearly independent points and such a set of D plus 1 points is shattered, we shown. Right? Given any M points, one as origin, remaining M minus 1 points are linearly independent, then the set is shattered. So, you take 0 and D linearly independent points, in order I can always get D linearly independent points. So, if I take 0 along with D linearly independent points, that gives me a set of D plus 1 points that is shattered. So, we now shown that there is at least one set of D plus 1 points in RD that is shattered. Now, take any, any set of D plus 2 points, we can take one of them as origin, then there are D plus 1 points now. Any set of D plus 1 points in RD will be linearly dependent because R d has dimension d, any set of d plus 1 points in R d will be linearly dependent and hence given any set of d plus 2 points in R d, <coughs> even if I take one of them as origin, the remaining d plus 1 points will be linearly dependent and the set is not shattered. So, we shown that there is at least one set of d plus 1 point that is shattered and no set of d plus 2 points is shattered and that shows that the V c dimension of hyperplanes in R d is d plus 1. Okay. So, it is a very important <coughs> theorem. So, essentially as the dimension grows, the complexity of learning um, hyperplane classifiers, learning linear classifier also grows. So, from 100 dimensional space, I want to learn 10,000 dimensional space uh, uh, hyperplane, then I need 100 times as many points. So, in the 100 dimensional space, if 1000 examples is enough to learn hyperplanes, in 10,000 dimensional space, I need 100,000 points, uh, 100,000 examples to learn the hyperplane to the same accuracy. Okay. Okay, so, this is last class on uh, class classical learning theory. So, let us quickly sum up. <coughs> Disk minimization is a general framework that captures all kinds of learning problems. Since we do not know the underlying probability distributions, a learning algorithm can only minimize the empirical risk. We minimize the empirical risk or some convenient family of functions h. This is the general strategy followed by almost all the learning algorithms that we consider, right. So, in that sense, we introduced a very nice generic framework in which all learning algorithms can be viewed as far as the statistical properties are concerned. And then we showed that minimization of empirical risk is an effective strategy only if the VC dimension of H is finite, right. We can only do minimization of empirical risk and doing that is effective if VC dimension is finite. Further, VC dimension of H gives us a good indication of the complexity of the learning uh, of, of learning a classifier from H. Essentially, if the, com uh, the complexity is large, then we need correspondingly larger number of examples. And the complexity also uh, um, checks with our intuitive notion of complexity as seen for hyperplanes in R d, we need d plus 1 parameters and the V c dimension is d plus 1. For axis parallel rectangles in R 2, we need 4 parameters and the V c dimension is 4 and so on. Okay. So, uh, this kind of completes what we are going to do on uh, statistical learning theory. So, from next class, we will we'll get back to looking at uh, classification algorithms uh, for nonlinear problems. Okay? Thank you.